Outback Stories. Outback Stories celebrates the pioneering spirit of Australia. It makes little difference if your family came on the first fleet or on a leaky boat last week. Our unique national identity was born and bred in the outback. These are your stories. The Babbling Brook, Old Poisoner, Busted Oven, Dirty Dick, The Bait Layer, The Murderer, were just some of the polite names bestowed on outback cooks. 19th century bush workers in the shearing shed, outback station or cattle camp ate to fill their stomachs. Food fashion came later, and most colonials simply wanted fuel to sustain their hard yakka. Being a bush cook was a tough life, made tougher by the continuing whinging of the men, many of whom saw baiting the cookie as an amusement. Old-time bush cooks didn't have to know much about cooking. It was more important to know how to fight, to make a knuckle sandwich. A popular taunt ran, Who called the cook a bastard? To which the inevitable response was, Who called the bastard a cook? But it's so oh dear, I feel so queer, I don't know what to do. The thought of leaving Fowler's Bay just breaks me heart in two. But if ever I catch that slushy, I'll make him rue the day. He ruined me constitution while sharing at Fowler's Bay. Rising an hour before the men, the cook and his offsider, typically called the slushy, had to gather and chop firewood, boil water, bake bread and prepare a hearty breakfast. The men expected five meals a day. Breakfast, lunch and supper were big, heavy meals, and the morning and afternoon breaks demanded stewed tea, damper and jam. The custom in the days of blade shearing was for the cook to be elected by secret ballot. Sometimes there were only one or two candidates, and other times up to half a dozen men applied. Experienced cooks with recommendations from shearers were preferred. With his fee and tips, a good cook could make more money than the shed hands and shearers. In the big sheds, the roustabouts often had their own cook. In the station house, the kitchen was usually managed by a woman, sometimes a married couple. Cooks had to make do with what rations they had or could scrounge. We find the cook, camp attendants and stockmen busily preparing to set out on a beef muster. Not the least of the equipment is the inevitable tomato sauce and golden syrup. The dead horse and cocky's joy, without which no bush cook would consider himself worthy of the name. Sheep, cattle and rabbits provided the main protein. Vegetables and fruit were a rarity. And many the man, struck by the barku rot, a sort of scurvy from lack of vegetables, declared the only cure to be beer and vegetables. There was a belief that fruit and vegetables were healthier when cooked. Most fruit was in cans and served with heavy custard. Tinned dog, the name given to any form of tinned salted meat, was a staple when drovers moved across the country. Tin dog, damper and tea, stuck to a man's guts. We often had it with treacle. We called it Cocky's Joy, or over in the West, Kidman's Joy. For most of the second half of the 19th century, Australia was one of the world's leading meat producers and consumers. We ate mutton and beef for breakfast, 
lunch and dinner. A meal without meat was unthinkable. By the late 1890s, our meat consumption was staggeringly high. The average diet in Australia included one third of a kilo of meat every day, four times more than the French, Italians, and Germans. Mutton was the most widely consumed and favoured meat, and in the shearing areas, it was virtually part of the wages. In the bush of Australia, you all are aware there are plenty of hardships and very rough fare, but with flour, fat, and sugar, I think you'll agree, a man can turn out some nice fritters for tea. Many cooks were known for their speciality, be it a stew, bake, or pie. In 1859, a Victorian squatter. Thomas Austin imported 24 rabbits, and as they say, the rest is history. Rabbit was added to the diet of the itinerant working brigade, and by the 1870s they were eaten fried, baked in pies, and stewed. He was cranky, he was lazy, he was greasy, he was sly. But he had a single virtue, the best rabbit pie. The evening meal in the shearing shed and in the droving camp was pretty often stew. There was one yarn about a cook who... The shearers reckoned he never, ever cleaned the stew pot. He just kept topping it up. And uh, they started to complain. So he thought, hmm, I better do something about this. So he dropped one of those Reckitt's blue bags from the laundry into the stew pot. And as the men came in that evening, he looked at them and he said, oh, I've got a bit of a surprise for you tonight, fellas. Change your menu. Blue stew. Our cookie is a baker and confectioner by trade And many a batch of sour bread and brownie he has made He turns out in the morning, gives us plenty of stewed tea So don't forget when Sheeran's done to sling the cookie's fees If the meat didn't clog up the system, the damper did. In truth, many cooks were experts with bread and pastry. We had a cook whose pastry was so light, we had to shut the hut windows. Otherwise, the pastries would float away. Monotony of diet was expected. Damper was the great stomach filler, and it came in all shapes and sizes. Damper was the staple bread, and fancy pastries included brownies, Johnny Cakes, and puffed a loonies, to name a handful. Brownies usually had a bit of sugar and, when available, currants. The standing joke was that when currants were unavailable, dead flies would do. They looked the same and had exactly the same crunch. Bush workers drank endless mugs of hot, strong tea, usually black china tea. Old-timers often had a brown ring around their mouth where the tea had stained skin and beard. The stain was known as Jack the Painter. A thirsty bush worker in the 1870s drank around 60 litres of tea a week. You can talk of your whisky and talk of your beer, but there's something much nicer that's waiting us here. It sits by the fire beneath the gum tree. There's nothing quite like it, a billy of tea. So fill up your tumblers as high as you can, and don't you dare tell me it's not the best plan. You can let all your beer and your spirits go free. I'll stick to me darling a whole billy of tea. Billy tea, that particular bush favourite, 
was always a subject for discussion, even argument. Some declared it must be made in an old billy, filled to the brim. A practical truth, otherwise the billy metal eventually melts. A couple of gum leaves? Add flavour? Doubtful, but who's to argue? And the billy is swung around in a circular motion to force the leaves to the bottom. Others swear you need to tap the billy ten times for them to settle, and served, sweet and black. The drover's cook had to be particularly skilled, unlike the station cook with mess huts, stoves, slaughterhouse, pantry and clean water, he had to contend with wet weather, short rations and weeks on the road. He had to look after his own horses and drive his cook's plant from camp to camp. Many were poor specimens of the cooking class and generally bad-tempered, with primitive notions of cookery. Cooks were always on the move, unloading and pitching tents, often in the rain, making a fire with wet wood, and cooking dinner for half a dozen men. He had to bake bread for the next day, turning out before daybreak to cook breakfast, pack up and head for the next camp. Unlike the station cook, who could be sacked, the drovers were usually stuck with their cook. The first six weeks, so help me Christ, we lived on cheese and half-boiled rice, doughy bread and cat's meat stew and corned beef that the flies had blew. The Chinese cook with his cross-eyed look filled our guts with his corned beef hashes, damned our souls with his half-baked rolls that had poisoned snakes with their greasy ashes. It wasn't unusual for new chum immigrants to take jobs as cooks. Germans, English, Scottish and Chinese were preferred over the Irish, who were viewed as argumentative and too ready with their mouths and fists. Some cooks were known for reading, reciting, singing, playing the concertina and yarning with the men. The cook's mess was often the same hut where the shearers slept. Sweat and stew smells were as one. There were few secrets, and some cooks wisely preferred to keep their mouths shut. One cook was famously named for the refrigerator, the Silent Night. He rarely spoke. Another was known as Sweeney Todd, because for a few extra bob, he would give the men haircuts on Sundays. There were definitely many unique characters in the cooking brigade. Slippery Soul was so called because we'd never seen him take a bath. He was so greasy, if you looked at him, your eyeballs would slip right off him. One cook was accused of leaving the bar of soap in the basin water until he protested, Listen, cobbers, I've only been here a week and I swear I haven't washed my hands yet. Shearer's cooks of today have modern equipment and many conveniences that their colonial forebears never ever thought of. In fact, some of the meals dished up in the outback would rival the best city restaurants. <laughs>